Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Board of Selectmen regular meeting of Wednesday, April 11th. And beginning 5 o'clock, uh, item 1, Woodbridge Board of Education. I invite up Superintendent Bob Gilbert. Good evening. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Happy spring, I hope. Finally coming. It's still cold. Saturday. Saturday. Saturday for, for a day or two, and then... Good, good. What's going to happen after that? I don't know. Microphone's on. We good on that? Yep. Okay. The little red light's on, so we are good. Okay. So good evening, everybody, and uh, um, good to see all of you again. Um, I'm sending around uh, our latest parent update that's going out as of today. Actually, went out this afternoon to all parents, Beecher Road School, and a copy for you folks as well. And we posted them around town hall. So just uh, just something for you to to look at when you have a chance. Um, my report will just sort of follow what we've normally been telling you about each month. Um, different highlights. Our enrollment. Um, as of today, um, as opposed to last last month, March, we've gone up by six students, so our enrollment continues to increase. We are at 846 in the building, 852 students overall that we're responsible for. Um, and again, that 846 compares to what was projected, was projected at 811 at the beginning of this year. Um, so we're up 35 students overall um, in the building from what we projected. Um, we're not done yet. As we know, we've got a couple more months to go, so we're expecting that number probably to increase, increase a little bit more as it typically does um, during the year. Um, our current um, budget status for FY18, um, as you know, there's been a trend over the last couple months of some increases um, due to special education and other related costs or other costs even in addition to special education. Um, from last month to now, we have increased another 23,000 total in terms of the, our deficit. Um, special education accounting for 14,000 of that. And um, other kinds of costs related to medical leaves and work, workers' comp, about $9,000. So we are up about 23,000 from where we were. Just again, to kind of give you just the storyline from, let's say, February till now, um, our special education deficit has gone from 171K to 188K in March to 203 in April. Um, overall deficit has, has been balanced by our other spending, which is in a positives, but we're still at 191 overall in deficit right now in April. Um, as I mentioned last month, you might remember me saying that there has been a trend and I am expecting Unfortunately, that the special education costs are going to increase over the last few months of the year based upon a number of factors, new move-ins, changes in programs, um, and other related costs. So um, I do expect that number to go up still by a few more this year. Um, in terms of next year's budget, um, the FY19 budget, which is still obviously in process and going to town hearing um, in a few weeks from now, um, I have sent a letter to um, First Selectman Heller as well as a Finance Board Chair Giglietti um, with a CC to, to um, Mr. Genovese just in regards to moving ahead with the collaboration we spoke a little bit about with our capital projects. As you know that we, um, some capital projects were removed from the budget, um, paving in the parking lot, erosion work in the, on the ground. So. Um, my goal in that letter is to just kind of move forward that idea of trying to see if we can have public works work together with the school to work on the grounds and get some of those kinds of things done at no cost to the town and just use our in-kind services for that. Um, in that letter, I also um, made an overture um, to try to orchestrate a visit, really to invite a, a visit from the joint boards to come to see the, the grounds of the school because there's going to be other things in the future that we're going to need to look at. So um, I'll, t I'll work through uh, Beth's office, obviously, to uh, orchestrate that. And you may be hearing about that, and you will be hearing about that as, as time goes on in terms of maybe trying to set a date where we all can get together and walk the grounds on a nice spring or early summer day. Um, our strategic plan initiatives continue to move forward at the building level. A lot of work going on in different things. I'll just highlight a couple. There's a lot of curriculum work going on in math and science. Our diversity committee is doing some planning of, in, of events that are related to and will be held during Arts Week in May. 
and we still have a number of initiatives related to our school-wide enrichment model that are moving forward. So um, a lot of lot of work that's going on there, and a lot of enthusiasm in those. Um, at the March Board of Education meeting, um, our school administration provided an update on our accountability plan. Um, we've seen some improvements in um, our student testing participation, our PE scores. We've seen a decrease in absenteeism. All good, all good areas. Um, we have some areas targeted for future work, and those are really to increase the rate of student growth as measured by the Smarter Balance assessments. Um, so that's where our work and our, our real uh, rolling of our sleeves is going to take place. Um, and speaking of Smarter Balance assessments, those tests that happen annually for grades three through six at our building will be taking place in the first weeks of March, first weeks of May. Um, as I speak right now, parent conferences are going on in the building. Um, parent conferences, this is parent conference week, so uh, parents have been in and out of the building. A lot of talk with teachers, obviously, about um, the growth of their students and how things are going, and, and this happens uh, twice a year. We also have our book fair going on this week as well, so there's a lot of activity in the building this week and through the evenings. Um, I think, as I mentioned last time, and it's still holding true, we have seven snow days recorded. Our last day of school at Beecher Road is Tuesday, June 19th. Um, we're not allowing any more weather to enter into our conversation, so we're leaving Thank it there. You. I'm sure you <laughs> share the same feelings about that. Um, summer program information has been out for a while, and it's, it's out there, and people are starting to sign up for our summer programs. And lastly, um, next week is April Vacation Week for the school, so teachers and students will be on break. They'll be returning on May 20th. In May, um, excuse me, April 23rd, Monday, and uh, they'll be getting ready for the home stretch of the school year at that point. Thank so, you. I'm not sure if there's any questions, any questions on anything. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Your absolutely, as far as the increase of it, um, the increasing in the deficit with special ed, is that primarily due to additional enrollment, or what's, what's, what's driving that? Going? So, what's driving that? So, what's driving that is. Um, Changes in programs, and it's it's really attributable mostly to students um, who are being serviced outside the district, so out, out of district placements. So there are some changes in programs. Sometimes there's changes in transportation that takes place. So um, more restrictive transportation usually requires more costly transportation. Um, we have had a recent move in um, that I'm um, not so sure that's going to remain. Um, or it's going to change again, but so those are the three main drivers that are causing that to take place. Is it a similar trend in other area school systems or school systems similar to ours? Yes, um, I did talk to it. It's interesting. So um, and it's, and it's, it gets into a confidentiality kind of an area. I don't want to talk too much, but we I can count on really on two on really two hands how many students we have who are placed out of district. Um, we have 850 total students in our building. Um, very few outplacements. And when I look at a town that's near us, um, they roughly have a, it's a district that has three times the number of students, but their number of outplacements instead of around this is more like 60. So districts, it depends on the district and it depends on the makeup and depends on other services, but um, it catches our attention, but it, it is an area of, that is every district is grappling with, um, and the per capita number for us is much lower than it is in most districts that would surround us. So, um, and there's, it, there's not always an apples to apples comparison, but um, it's a statewide, a national trend, and it's certainly felt at the local level as well. Thank you. Anything else? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item two, um, uh, we have a res there's a resolution, a draft resolution in your packet um, regarding the town of Woodbridge resolution supporting shared solar and virtual net metering. And I invite Claire Coleman and uh, Claire here, yep. and yep. John Gorm up to discuss this with us. Hopefully, you've all had a chance to review it and the data that was in your packet. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Gorham. I'm chair of the Woodbridge Ad Hoc Sustainability Committee. I'm glad to be here in front of you again. Um, our committee is pleased to have Claire Coleman assisting us in our efforts to advocate for virtual net metering, metering and shared solar. Claire is an energy policy expert at the Connecticut Fund for the Environment. 
Uh, we originally wanted her to be a member of our committee, but her time commitments and children, I guess, got in the way. Where they wouldn't allow it. <laughs> However, she's agreed to help us out on specific issues such as this one. Our committee is active looking into this issue, these issues, and we ask that you, the Board of Selectmen, um, while the Connecticut General Assembly is still in, in session, we ask you to call upon our elected officials, namely Representative uh, Themis Clarities, Senators George Logan and Gail Slushberg, as well as Governor Malloy, the DEP, and United Illuminating. We'd like you to ask them to support legislation to enable a statewide uh, shared solar and virtual net metering program, these programs. As you know, uh, Woodbridge uh, has a long-standing history of advancing solar, starting back in 2010 when the high school kids earned solar collectors for their building. And uh, we've also had a, pro a proliferation of town installations at Beecher Road School, the JCC, the Teen Center, Mazzaro Community Farm, the town library, and other projects. Um, also, as you know, solar has been installed in many residential homes, thanks in large part to the Solar Challenge program. So we've made some progress, but there's a, a, a lot more that can be done. And uh, it's my belief that these obstacles are not technical, but rather bureaucratic and regulatory in nature. Shared solar allows for people who can't put solar on their homes, that allows them to benefit from a solar array. And if our town would take advantage of virtual net metering uh, tied to a community solar project, it could lower our town's energy bills. And that's good for all of us. So thank you for considering Claire's thoughtful presentation that I believe are in all your packets. I'm going to turn it over to her to see if uh, you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much for the kind introduction and for taking the time um, to allow us to present today. Um, uh, Woodbridge um, is where I grew up and where I am choosing to raise uh, my family currently, and I'm really proud of all the, the great work that we've done on many levels, but particularly on, on clean energy. Um, and my day job is um, working at Connecticut Fund for the Environment. Um, we're an environment, statewide environment um, and um, climate um, nonprofit, and I do a lot of advocacy work in our legislature. Um, and as John mentioned, we're currently um, working to uh, move the legislature to expand opportunities for clean energy um, in two areas, um, shared clean energy and virtual net metering. So there, these are actually two versions of essentially the same thing. <laughs> um, and I'll explain that a little bit. Um, shared clean energy is also called a um, community solar, and it basically refers to anyone who can, um, or any community members or businesses or uh, municipal buildings that could come together to put a solar array that, that members um, in different places remotely could participate in. Now, in Connecticut, virtual net metering is essentially the same thing, but it's limited to state um, agriculture and towns. So the way it's defined in Connecticut is different from in other states. Um, so virtual net metering is sort of a version of shared solar, and shared solar is a version of a virtual net metering, depending on how you look at it. But they both provide opportunities um, to access both the clean energy and the bill savings of a solar array that you're not directly on-site connected to. So um, if um, Connecticut were to open up these opportunities, the solar array um, at Beecher, for example, could help offset the electricity costs of our fire station. Um, Connecticut currently has two um, laws in place which have provided very limited opportunities in these areas. Um, we have a virtual net metering law um, that um, was initially set at a $10 million annual cap that was quickly met Towns raced to take advantage of this because of the potential bill savings that John referenced. Um, and some towns, in fact, Woodbridge was included, um, were referred to as stranded towns because they started the application process and then the money ran out. Um, and the legislature did provide a little more money for um, certain um, applications in certain instances, but in our view, this should be opened up to every town that wants to participate. Um, and similarly, sh um, shared solar or virtual net meeting, it, it shouldn't be limited to just towns and municipalities. It should be opened up to our businesses. 
Um, we should be encouraging our businesses here in Woodbridge to put solar on their roofs and um, sizing the solar array so that other people who live in the town might not be able to put solar on their roof because it's shady um, or they don't have access for whatever reason. They could actually buy into that solar array and then get credit on their, on their electric bill. So those are the concepts of, of shared solar and virtual net metering. Um, and in, a, in addition to the statewide legislative advocacy work we're doing, because this impacts so many towns and local businesses, um, my organization has um, started an initiative to literally go town by town, city by city, and ask for support and ask um, town um, governing bodies to um, ask for support from our state legislature and our state um, representatives and um, our governor. Um, we've had um, sort of two kickoff successes with Hartford and New Haven have passed resolutions and um, have several this month before other towns. Um, and we're hoping that that will help, um, make, help us make the case at the Capitol that this is something that towns need and want and will benefit from. So we would greatly appreciate your support in having the town of Woodbridge pass the resolution that's, that's in your packet. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. What is the funding source for installation of these panels? Is this part of a, a power purchase agreement? Right, so there's a power purchase agreement through the, um, the electric distribution companies, our utilities, mm -hmm. UI, and Eversource. They, um, and the, the programs are basically rate-based. Um, so <coughs> there's not a, um, so they go into the, the same cost, just like Eversource um, mm -hmm. and UI, a portion of cost for purchasing natural gas, or you know, we used to do coal, we don't do coal anymore. All of, all of our energy sources are, are rate-based, and they spread them evenly across all rate payers. But typically, for a power purchase agreement, the rate is lower than a commercial rate. Right. Yeah. Anyone have any questions for John or Claire? What is the, in doing, in doing this in the municipalities that have been doing this, what is the involvement and implication to the, to the town itself, the municipality itself? Is there anything, or is it just the resolution, basically, or is there more? Right, so what this resolution does, it just says you, you support um, expanding access in these two mm -hmm. areas. If the town was to move forward with a virtual net metering um, facility on a brownfield or um, you know, on one of the town buildings, um, you would put in an application with, the, um, with UI. Mm -hmm. um, they would, um, you know, assuming we can lift the cap to allow more applications, they, part of the law is requiring them to set up the interconnection required. Um, and then you would, it would be just like you have solar on your house, the town would get the bill. Um, and you would see a significant drop in your utility expenses. Is there a cap on the power um, that can be produced? Yes, there is. The virtual net metering law, uh, it's currently, I believe, has to be under three megawatts. So, um, you know, a megawatt is, I think, about a thousand homes. Do you, do you, um, do you envision that changing, or would you be working to increase that? Um, yeah, well, the, the shared solar bill currently um, seeks to allow up to five megawatts. Five. So it has some provisions, um, it has some provisions in it encouraging smaller um, arrays that could be placed to use up all the rooftop space, because that that's really um, you know, the benefit. We have all these empty, empty roofs, and that's space that it's cheaper, and it you know, protects other, other lands. Avoids those concerns. Cool. We have 22,000 square feet of south facing roof on the clubhouse at the Woodbridge Country Club. That's um, a lot of power. Claire, you know, just Sounds for the people like who, are, who are new on the board, the town really went very far in this virtual net metering the last year. We actually chose a, a company to do the power purchase agreement. We engaged a specialist lawyer who walked us through an application that was filed uh, with, with the state. And we had serious negotiations about actually doing this this program, but the state, as you said, ran out of money, and also there was a cap on the number of communities that would be allowed to do it, and we were just above the cap. We, we were a little bit too late, so we missed it. But we, we were all set, and we have everything in place to go. 
it. It'd be wonderful if, if um, we were able to change the law and lift the cap um, right. and then allow mm -hmm. Woodbridge to get back in that process. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board? Um, I would first, I think, um, enter. Have you, you, you yes. reviewed this? Yes. Okay. It's good with Claire. It's okay with me. Yeah. <laughs> right. And um, uh, yes. I certainly was. Keep in mind, we've already done that. We've done this. The board, the last board, has already approved it, and we've gotten, gotten, got had the thing underway. We didn't approve this, Jerry. No, we didn't approve the rest of it. But we had, we're in the program. I understand that. No, it's but about that, just. But saying. that's not what this is. Right. Okay. So, uh, because we have to, can we add to the agenda an item to approve this? I think you're going to have a two-thirds vote, and you can do it. Okay. So I will entertain a motion, number one, to waive the reading of the resolution supporting shared solar and virtual net metering. Second. Is there a second? Thank you. All in favor of waiving the reading? Okay. You guys? We, we have a motion on waiving the reading of the... We have... Yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay, waiving the reading. Okay, thank you. So that's unanimous. Thank you. Then um, I will make a motion that we add an item to the agenda to approve the resolution supporting shared solar and virtual net metering. Second. Any discussion on that motion? Okay. All in favor of adding it to the agenda? Aye. Aye. Okay, Joe? Opposed. Oh, okay, opposed to adding it. Okay, so that's 5-1. And now, since it's been added to the agenda, I will make a motion that we approve the resolution supporting shared solar and virtual net metering. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? All in favor? So I. I Whoop, oh. Discussion, sorry. <laughs> I went too quick. Part of the reason that I just got this big package, I believe yesterday afternoon. I know this, I think, went out earlier. This went out Monday. Well, the resolution Monday. Maybe, but this thing. Monday. Okay. Well, explaining what mm -hmm. what it all is, then it just went right. Out we asked Claire to afternoon. come tonight to see if they sort of sum that up. But okay. Right. The agenda doesn't show that you're going to ask for action, so maybe it's my mistake for not putting enough time into really looking at this. But okay. typically, if I see an agenda that requires action, then I'll put in the requisite time. So okay. that's part of my reservation. Okay. The other reservation I have is, since I just started to look at this, now therefore be it resolved. Number two. So this resolution asks the Board of Selectmen for the town basically tell our representatives that they should do this. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But our representatives represent a lot of townspeople and citizens and all. And so uh, I, mm -hmm. I have a reservation of this body speaking for everyone in town and telling representatives of the state higher at a higher level than I am what they should do in representing their to support legislation to enable statewide shared solar. I, I know what it says, right. but yeah. that, okay. this is more of a procedural thing than perhaps anything else. But I don't know that it's this board's job to tell the state representatives what to do. It might be the individual citizen's mm -hmm. right to do, but. I'll respond to in, from a personal standpoint. The reason I support it is very specifically because I've had a number of conversations with a number of people, friends people, well, you know, acquaintances and things of that nature as it relates to solar energy and solar generally speaking. And I found by and far, by and large, the, those people are very forward. As a matter of fact, a lot of the conversation I have is exactly what you mentioned in terms of people say, geez, I wish I could get it, but I have too many trees. Geez, I wish I could get it, you know, this issue and that, that type of thing. So just talking from a personal standpoint, my sense in terms of supporting it is because I do feel, based on conversations and input that I've received from a number of people, that the solar is very much supported. And if folks can benefit from from obtaining that type of benefit without 
and not having to do something on your own, like cut down trees. Like, I'd like to have it at my house. We have a couple of trees. My wife doesn't want them to go kind of thing. You and I had that conversation. (laughs) Right. And I don't know if you had 8,800 conversations, but I respect the fact that some people you know may be in favor of it. I'm not necessarily not in favor of it. I I didn't really think I said that. In fact, I went very close to having solar panels put on my house not more than two months ago. But some of the contracts they want you to sign are a little crazy. (laughs) So I understand that this might be good if, if you could avoid those contracts and, and get solar energy in a certain way. But having been presented with something that's fairly substantial, you know, almost 24 hours ago, not being told we were going to have action, and then being asked to basically give a directive to the state, the representatives. I, I'm, I'm just a little uncomfortable with it. That's all. So only you're... one vote. I'm sure it's going to pass. So right. I'm just letting people but I'd like, know. I'd like to also add that, based on what's happened, the fact that it was capped, and the fact that it was the money ran out so quickly, kind of indicates that there's a, a, a groundswell, if you will, for lack of a better way to put it, in terms of um, in terms of support. So, I'd be surprised if the representatives who are mentioned here as far as our representatives aren't very much aware, and it, it would surprise me if they didn't support it. So my support is very specifically to say that I, I go in and, and indicate to, I'd be happy to go and talk to any one of these folks and say, hey, listen, I think it's a great idea what, you know, as a, as a group. I think as an individual, you have more than the right to do that, and, and that's fine. But I, I've, I've put in my reservations. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Any discussion? Yeah. Um, Thank you for that. There, are there a minimum number of su- subscribers that have to buy into this? There are, but let me just, well, there are various proposals on the table, and let me just emphasize and perhaps alleviate some concern that this does not um, ask you to support a specific bill or any specific terms of, of the bills before the General Assembly right now. It's very general. It just, it just asks you to support um, allowing these programs to um, and for right right now, the current version of um, the shared solar bill I think requires up to at, I mean, it's at least three members, uh, three and uh, three participants. So you could have it divvied up between you know Masara Farm and the farmhouse and two neighbors down the street who want to you know take take advantage. Um, in practice, the you know. Economies of scale are such that if you if you can get more community members interested, um, the cheaper it can be for everyone. And, and there, as I understand it, there's no upfront cost with these installations. Well, the financing terms can vary depending on uh, gotcha. the developer. Usually, um, they don't require um, upfront payments other than a monthly payment, um, and right. then you're then credited on your electric bill. The, sort the, of a circular transaction. The, the installer would get the, 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 tax, the tax benefits that a municipality can't get. Yes. Right. Yeah. But so they should pass on some of those benefits, just as when we get it on, you know, on our our rooftops in our home. Okay. We'll call the motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Okay. Motion passes 5 1. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Okay. Moving on to item three, the first selectman's report. I um, thought I was going to try to be brief, and I'll do my best. Um, there are a few items I'd like to address in my report this month. As we know, many people have contacted us regarding the potential dog park, and I will get to that shortly in my remarks. However, I want to start by reviewing some larger priorities and updating everyone on progress we have made. As you know, our town was visited by the epidemic. Does this this make it louder? What makes it louder? I'm going to have to yell. (laughs) Okay, my apologies. This is as much as it gets. Okay. I'll be getting to the dog park. I'll sum up the first part. I'll be getting to the dog park at the end. And it, raise your hand if you can't hear me. Pretty good so far? Michael, you can't hear me? 
Okay, you raised your hand, okay. No problem. <laughs> Trying to be aware of everybody. I know we have a big room here tonight. As you know, our town was visited by the epidemic of gun violence last week. We're all aware of such crimes that take place in other places, but we're not used to hearing about a homicide in Woodbridge. This is a very sad situation, and I wanted to take a moment to thank our outstanding team of first responders, EMS, fire, and police for their work. I'm going to run out of breath talking so loud. Sorry. <coughs> Uh, Police Chief Frank Cappiello updated me this morning that his detectives are working day and night on this joint investigation with the state police major crimes unit and the state's attorney. They're making good progress. He has assured me this was an isolated incident, but he did say that this is certainly the worst crime to occur in Woodbridge in his almost 39 years of service here. Such major major crime investigations of tourists, of course, take resources, and we can expect to see an impact on our town budget as a result. I promise to keep you all updated. As for the larger picture of our town budget, as you know, we are preparing now for the preliminary budget hearing, which will take place April 23rd at 7.30 in the center gym. The major, many budget awards that our town has consistently earned in recent years does not come without a good deal of hard work, and I want to express appreciation to Finance Director Tony Genovese and his staff, as well as all of our town employees who helped get us to the budget that ensures continued continued excellence for town services and education, but is respectful to taxpayers and uses every dollar wisely. I hope to see everyone at the budget hearing where we will have a presentation covering all the details. Another update concerning budget. My staff had a kickoff meeting on April 3rd with CERC to begin to discuss with them the fiscal health analysis portion of the work we have contracted for. CERC has begun to analyze all the data we have supplied. Our expectation is that this analysis will continue through June and they will be ready to present some findings and conduct a facilitated discussion with the Board of Selectmen at our July meeting. After that, they can, they will take our input back and formulate a final report for us, which we can expect by August. I think, th- I think this will be a very helpful information. This will be very helpful information for us, and I'm looking forward to us having the opportunity to gain these insights. A few more scheduling, or should I say rescheduling news. The storm response postmortem meeting I told you about last month had to be postponed because it was scheduled on the day the homicide took place and our first responders were understandably not available. It has now been rescheduled for April 24th. I thank Mrs. Shaw for her heroic efforts in trying to get nine people together at one time. Likewise, our microgrid ribbon cutting ceremony has again been been rescheduled due to changing availability of the governor and the commissioner of DEEP. It will now take place in May. We're looking forward to it. I will let you know the exact date. As of right now, it's May 7th at 11 a.m. Something that apparently is going to take place on schedule, I have received some preliminary information about the commencement of the DOT road work on Lower Litchfield Turnpike, which, as you know, is a state road. After awarding contracts, the DOT has just announced, as of two days ago, that construction work will begin on April 16th. Our Economic Development Commission will be helping to reach out to affected businesses and neighbors in the area with more specific details about what we can expect. And we are utilizing the resources of CERC to assist in these efforts. Again, we will keep you all up to date on this as soon as we have more information. We put it, we have what we have, it's just basically right now maps. And I've asked for more, so we'll see. And we will be posting details to the town website, and you may expect a business news e-blast to go out next week. To wrap up my first selectman's report, I will just briefly list the other meetings and community events I took part in the past month. On March 16th, we several of us served lunch at the annual St. Patrick's Luncheon at the Senior Center. Um, I attended the JCC ribbon cutting ceremony dedicated the new, took place in dedication of the new Beverly Levy Child Care Center and also the signing of the proclamation regarding the days of remembrance for victims of the Holocaust. Two days later, no, that was the same day, actually, I went to the Darling House Open House event. On the 19th, I presented a proclamation to the Woodbridge Board of Education for Board Member Appreciation Month. On the 23rd, we received a $3,000 donation from Dwight Rowland on behalf of the Bethwood Baseball League, which is contributed annually to help maintain town ball fields. I believe that's in your packet later. We'll be accepting the money. 
On the 27th, I met with um, the chairman of Scrog, Carla Mento, with Tony. We had a nice lunch to discuss some opportunities for regionalization. On the 28th, I attended the monthly Scrog meeting. Uh, on the 20th, I was, I don't think it was the 20th, but attended the Masaro Farm annual meeting. And I attended the Masaro board meeting in the newly renovated liaison role of first selectman. On the 6th, I attended the annual Amity dinner and a play event. And I hope you all have tickets because it's a fantastic play. They did a great job as usual. And on the 8th, I attended the Eagle Court of Honor ceremony for three local Boy Scouts for some wonderful projects. And lastly, on the 9th, I had attended a luncheon <coughs> with um, not just me, many uh, mayors and first selectmen uh, with Rosa DeLora, where we heard about legi legislative developments in Washington and some new opportunities for federal grants. On that last note regarding grants, as you know, this is a big priority for me, so I want to update you on two grant applications we were waiting to hear about. We did not receive monies from the Wiederhold Foundation. We had submitted a grant for the, for the animal shelter, but we have other possible funding sources that might be available, so please stay tuned. But however, we did receive positive news from the Small Cities Program from the state. This will at last allow us to move forward with the ramp and handicap accessible bathroom facility upgrade at the Senior Center. Now, with regard to the dog park, you have in your packet several items. I hope you all have them, color-coded, etc. You might want to pull them out at this point. We have received a lot of input from community members. Thank you all for being involved. It's wonderful. I want to assure you, the public, that each of the phone messages, texts, and emails that we have received have been provided to all Board of Selectmen members. These are part of the public record and are available for anyone who wants to see them. We've also received petition pages. Again, these are also part of the public record. We have made a print printout of just the top page of the petition so that the selectmen have a chance to read the text of the petition itself. I believe that there are 324 or 42? Three, what? 352 signatures on that petition. In addition to sharing all comments received, and they were coming in as late as 4.30 today, please know that I will be providing an update to everyone who has given us an email address and a message that will go out later this week recapping tonight's meeting. You will recall that at our March Board of Selectmen meeting, we voted in favor of establishing a dog park, but wanted to review more information regarding the location. I asked down town staff members to continue the process of review and look into this further, working with representatives of the dog park group to see if we could identify a good location to recommend to the Board of Selectmen. We are still reviewing options, so I don't think that any final decision can be made tonight. In addition, we have said that we intend for there to be no outlay of town funds to establish the dog park. But we do have some information to provide as an update this evening. In your packet, I don't know if you want to pull them out. How can I get these up or small because there's so many of them. But um, grid number one is the complete listing of town-owned property. This grid is based on the Coupop listing that was included in the 2015 POCD appendix. We have added notes in the far right column in red ink. You will see that three properties highlighted in yellow are preliminarily coming to the top of the list for further study. Number one, the Fitzgerald Track, 100 Center Road. Number two, the former CCW property at 50 Woodfield Road. And number three, the Town Center Campus, which is actually three separate parcels listed in the grid as 149, 151, and 11 Meeting House Lane. Additional information for you includes some material regarding ADA requirements and other legal issues, the 1982 Coupop book pages regarding the Fitzgerald track purchase, which Joe had asked me for this afternoon. We were able to dig it up, and it's in there. Yep. A drawing marking out the current use of various areas of Fitzgerald for farming, community garden, etc., and the cover and sample grid page of a dog park study from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So at this point, I know you got this all late, and um, we, we just kept getting asked for things, and we have it all. And this is all available to any member of the public that would like a copy of this. Bonnie got, I think, some copies of some of it, right, yesterday, I hope? Yep, okay, for her request. So at this point, I would open it up to discussion about where you would like to go with this at this point. So before that, Matt, yeah. Matt first slide. Sure. I was in Shelton Monday and was pleasantly surprised to drive by their dog park. And I don't know if it's appropriate for someone from our staff Sorry, to visit. 
You got to yell. <laughs> I was uh, in Shelton Monday and was pleasantly surprised to see their dog park. So I'm suggesting that the appropriate person uh, might want to visit that dog park for give us more information on its uh, location and its contents. It was fenced in and appeared to be very, you know, very appropriate. Okay, thank you. I'm personally in favor. I think it's a great addition. <laughs> oh, there's my microphone. I'm still in <laughs> Oh, gee, sorry about that. It might be attached. Okay. I'm in favor of the dog park. Um, I think we have some new venues that we've just got in our packet. Um, so I think I would be interested to hear about the uh, opinions of the members of the committee to see if they have any preference. Um, on the new locations that were proposed. Okay. Do we have anything at this point? I, I'm, I very much agree with Terry in terms of just having the information being recent, so there's still more consideration, and obviously most of the decisions we make are very much influenced by what most what most of the people want. Right. We so have we really there's a lot of data on this. There's a lot which, of data. Right. Yeah. Which took quite a while the past month. I have to say, we've worked really hard at putting it together. As I mentioned to you, Joe, yesterday when we talked, there was a lot of to go over. And um, I think it would be important for all the selectmen, since this is our decision, to really take some time and, uh, you know, drill down on this. And um, if you feel that it was something that was perhaps ruled out for one reason or another, would like it revisited, please let us know. And um, we can go from there. David, anything? David or uh, Joe? Sorry, I should have called in. No, no, no. I, I agree with what you just said. I mean, okay. you just got all this information. Right. Um, and you can see it took a long time. Yeah, a lot of locations. Yeah, this is all good work, but there's, right. you know, a lot of locations here that maybe we even need to go see. You know, I mm -hmm. checked out what you said the other day right. down right. below here, and I went over to. Uh, Fitzgerald and walked around there. Mm -hmm. I mean, what 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 I think we do know is there's people against it at Fitzgerald and there's people for it at Fitzgerald. Um, that seems to be the location that uh, talks about I, I whether would, it's positive or negative. Right. So. I would have to say most of the letters and the emails and the texts that I thank you all for. I don't think there was anybody who was not in favor of a dog park. So we've got that part done. And uh, certainly the Board of Selectmen voted unanimously to go forward. At least for those the that are is, about it. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure there's right. someone who's not good. They haven't but, said it <laughs> but, but, we, but we are. I'm talking about the letters we received. Right, no, you're right. Right. I guess it's just Those that question. are not in favor of a dog park at all did not write to us. Right. And so it's a so. question of where it's going to be. Correct. Right? And, you know, I, I personally would hate to see... Um, such a good addition to our town turn into an issue of contention where you have people lining up on two sides and it becomes a you know net sum zero game. I, plan to I speak think to we that later. Yeah, yep. okay, all right. But yep. it's okay though, you're right. No, Thank I I, you. I think we have Ditto. to find a solution that's gonna satisfy the the most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I think that I agree, but I think that may take some people moving off a position of one way or another. Pro Fitzgerald or or Con Fitzgerald because I don't know well, I don't know that I don't know that we can do that if we make a decision at Fitzgerald that's going to be contentious. Well, it we'll seems see. to me. We'll yeah, we'll I see. agree. Right. So um, I would I would guess I would ask you all to take some time and there's quite a bit of uh, data in here. If anyone in the audience would like a copy of this, any of this, please call tomorrow. We'll make sure we can send it out to you. So. Um, that takes care of that. Anyone have any other comments? And I would on suggest that, at this that point? We, we visit some of these areas to get a feel for what they're like. Yes. I'm not going to oppose that, certainly. Okay. Yep. <laughs> it, now that yep. we know where they are, we can look at them ourselves. A little bit more I, difficult than when we I, had to do I, a road trip. I did have to a the, question the about the 11 Meeting House Lane site. What, yeah. what, is, what is that? You want to speak to that, Sheila? She sure. put the grid together and. If you take a look at it's the not grid. going in here. <laughs> well, <laughs> right here. Right here. Sorry. Sorry. Um, the last page of the grid, uh, we're using the Ann Arbor, Michigan study as a kind of a model. We pulled up 
three areas, but if you, you find something else on that larger grid you want us to look at. Um, so we're calling it Town Center Campus. It's uh, the parcel that's called 11 Meeting House Lane actually goes back this way, includes the Public Works building and okay. the area near the tennis court. Okay. Is that the one that was marked off? Marked off? Yeah. That's no longer marked, it was briefly no, marked the, off. It was inadvertently marked uh, by someone who thought we might want to see where it was, and we didn't know about it, so it was a little surprising to me. But um, I guess Bonnie went back and took them down because there was some concern when you put stakes in the ground. We have to tell someone at town hall has to know about it. I didn't want to get into it too much, but that's fine. But God that's forbid, the there's a we're talking about. roughly in that area, not, not necessarily. It might be more space, less space. We just don't know. That was sort of a. It was, parcel it was a, is, uh, it, it's 100 or 141, I think, uh, 151 Center Road. Uh, they're all sorted together. We, we don't know exactly where that, which okay. one is called 11 Meeting House Lane and which one is called the other one. It's on the grid in a couple different places. So what I, I would all ask all of you to go out and begin taking a look, you know, and, and with the grid and, you know, we can put things back on into the, and then very nicely we have a, a, um, a new grid, which is, and if, certainly if you want to add, this is where we are right now with the three possibilities at this point, Town Center Campus, former CCW, and Fitzgerald Tract with some um, criteria at the top. And we can certainly add criteria if you would like to have other things other than size, parking, and ADA, uh, conflict avoidance, fencing, and um, surface, it's kind of light, and notes. So... So, that so, was our start, but we can add properties so to that. So as of right now, the work that's been done by staff internally filters down to these three tracks. Right. right. I have to say that um, I, if I would be remiss if I didn't thank Adam Parsons for his help with this, because he, he went on every single one of these and was, was wonderful that way. So thank you. Anything else on that item then? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Stay tuned. We're still public comment coming. Okay, uh, liaison reports. Terry? Alrighty. I have to find it under this pile. Hold on, bear with me. Okay. Um, Bob Gilbert, once again, did a great job with the Beach Board of uh, Woodbridge Board of Ed. I attended the Amity Board of Ed on um, Monday night. Um, it was a lengthy meeting. We had four middle school and two high school students that were uh, that received recognition awards, which is always fun to, to see. Um, and um, I think the only thing really that's relevant to this board was the uh, letter of resignation by our superintendent, uh, Dr. Dumay. No word yet on a search committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, several meetings of the police commission and the town planning and zoning i'll speak to the town planning and zoning commission meeting first on monday april 2nd uh during the public hearing jim urbano who's developing seven units at 18 hazel terrace appeared and recommended that originally there was a tower uh, that was part of the project and he recommended that that be deleted the only question remains is the bonding and what the uh, amount of the bond will be. So that worked out very well. Um, also, they spoke to the uh, update of zoning regulations. Primary, the re they will retain the present zoning regulations for re residential places. They are concerned about uh, more box stores and mixed use. And there will be a public hearing, you know, coming up in uh, the near near future. In regards to the police commission, uh, the homicide, as you mentioned, uh, was addressed. Uh, that is uh, presenting an a, a, um, overtime problem for the police commission, which has uh, budget implications. And so eventually, with Tony, they will work that out. Uh, in addition, uh, there was a vote at the first of two meetings in regards to the elimination of the lieutenant position. Uh, the motion was made to eliminate the position of the lieutenant, and it was defeated uh, three to one by the commission. And so uh, that creates another budget issue 
uh, for the police commission. And that basically uh, is an update on those two commissions. Thank you. The, there was not a uh, government TV session this, this month. Um, the Recreation Department met, but I was not able to make that. I was out of state, and the last EDC meeting was, I, I reported on that. They meet again tomorrow. So, no updates. No, no reports, but I have, can I ask a question of, you skipped me. No one Well, she's coming back. I, mm -hmm. I start this way, and this way I'm not okay. skipping you. Yeah. Never I'll, skip. She knows I'm We're quick. We're riveted. I, I don't <laughs> have any reports, <laughs> Joe, jo, can I ask you, can I ask Joe a question? I think so, sure. With respect to the lieutenant position, there was an. I, I thought they. I thought that position was previously acted upon by the commission. No, uh, there was a motion uh, at that uh, the April tenth meeting uh, to eliminate the position, and there was one vote in favor, not you, and three against. Okay. Am I out? Uh, it changed. It changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fair enough. I just yeah. wanted to clarify because right. I thought right. initially that had been voted on and it was right. a different result. You're absolutely right. right. Yeah. And I just add uh, one thing in regards to the report of the chief of police. Uh, they have a program where they did speak to Amity Regional High School about school safety, which I think was very important. Do you have a report? No. Okay. David. Yeah. Uh, can I just ask? Uh, Joe, a question. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> um, you were at the at the town planning and zoning commission meeting. I watched it on TV, and I, the sound wasn't great. Mm -hmm. My impression was that they were going to leave everything alone in terms of zoning change, except for development district one. Was was that your impression of being at the meeting? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. And the, the primary concern was, as I mentioned previously, was. Uh, Box stores being mm -hmm. able to have access to certain areas. And, and Dev 1 is an area that includes the Bradley Road parcels. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And there will be a public hearing in the next several weeks. Well, well for I'm not sure that's correct, though. Well, yeah. But yeah, we better leave it. Changing Dev 1. I'm, I, I'm not sure. I think that that may not be correct. We'll have to find out. And get There's it. a special meeting 424 right. for anybody who wants to follow that up. Thank you. Good. And I don't think we have any committee reports. I have well, my Dave, have my report. Report. Did, 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 did. <laughs> <laughs> or, or did I use up my time? I'm out of here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I went to the, I went to the coup <laughs> I'm going to call on you first next time, so be prepared, David. I'm so sorry. I went to the coup pop Jeez. meeting. Uh, the first part was a presentation by Andy and Tara Stack, who are in charge of the community gardens, and they addressed the commission at the public comment session. According to the existing regulations, to which the gardeners agree when they signed up for a plot. Required plots are to be maintained free of trash and accumulated debris and to be left clean and neat with removal of tools, furniture, and sheds at the end of the season. Most, but not all, gardeners are in compliance, and the stacks are requesting help in policing these issues. Perhaps a letter from the town could be considered. They also uh, talked about the water tanks. There are two water tanks which supply water to the gardeners. They're both rusting. One is unusable, it's completely rusted through. The other one is almost rusted through. We'll need, need to yeah, yeah, shout it out. Okay. Water tanks. There are two water tanks that supply water to the gardeners. They're rusting out. One is unusable and almost rusted through. They will need to be replaced. Possibly one um, could be obtained from the town. The stacks also expressed concern con about the location of a dog park on the back field of the Fitzgerald property, both because it would disturb the tranquility of the gardens and might create issues with cars driving to the back field. Um, on another note, in order to be eligible for rewards to Sustainability Connecticut, Coupop, in concert with the Conservation Commission, is documenting their open space plan, cataloging properties, updating their list, Prioritizing, prioritizing lands for protection, maintaining wildlife corridors, connecting open space parcels, offering recreational benefits, and ensuring long-term viability. These actions would qualify Woodbridge for 10 points towards recognition from, um, from Sustainability Connecticut. Uh, I attended the Library Commission meeting. Um, 
The Friends of the Library book sale is going to be combined with the Garden Club sale this year on June 2nd. Okay. Uh, there is an HVAC replacement to be scheduled. I understand that has been approved. It's, it's, gone out it's on the agenda. Tonight. It's on the agenda, yeah. Um, they may need... They may need to close the library for a short period of time when that installation is done. They'd like to do that during um, the, the season between heating and cooling seasons, probably October. The PEEPS vote is April 20th. Oh, the, uh, the PEEPS. <laughs> the PEEPS, right, the PEEPS vote, okay. The April what? A, um, April 20th. The farmer's market will now be coordinated with library-sponsored concerts on the first and second Tuesdays in August. The farmers markets last year were coordinated with movie night, which proved less successful because movies could not start until dark, dark and the farmers closed up at dusk. Movies will be held the first two. The movies will be held the last two Tuesdays in August. All of the events are made possible by the friends of the library. The commission also voted to close the library on May second, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. to train staff on the new video. Um, Human Services meeting. The commission members will be attending the budget meeting April 23rd. Uh, they will also be investigating smaller vehicles to replace the bus when the time comes to replace that, that vehicle. Um, they're also seeking $150,000 from the building maintenance uh, fund for, from the from building maintenance department for renovation of the center. They plan on, among other things, opening a wall between the kitchen and the dining room. And they're also talking about painting over the mural when they remodel. In lieu of covered shelters for the vehicles, drivers are using roof rakes to remove snow. They would prefer, prefer having a shelter, but right now they don't. Uh, and youth services, Seabin Park will be receiving the first Selectman's Youth Award at a volunteer tea April 26th at 2 p.m. And that's it. Well, that's, that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Um, what can we get in in three minutes? Survey results. Yeah. <laughs> Wise guy. Um, how about number 11? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to jump ahead because we have three minutes before public comment to item 11 on the agenda. Refer the renovation of the old firehouse to town plan and zoning for an 824 review. And um, is there anything? We're, we have final design. We have final. Uh, shout it out. <laughs> <laughs> we have final design documents uh, and, and drawings, and those have been submitted to the uh, building office for review. And uh, so they have all the information that they need. So if okay with you, I would entertain a motion to refer the renovation of the old firehouse to town plan and zoning for an 824 review. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, I think we have two minutes to do the affirmations. Item 12. Anybody okay with that? Yes. Okay, let's go. In your packet, you have um, what we call state affirmations, which every year are submitted, one being an ADA notice, affirmation, affirmative action policy statement, compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the ADA Municipal Grievance Procedure, Town of Woodbridge Conflict of Interest Policy, the Fair Housing Policy Statement, that's it. And um, fair, housing resolution. fair housing resolution. Okay, in addition to the fair housing policy statement. Thank you. And I believe we do these every year, Mrs. Shaw. Right. right. So um, I would number one uh, ask for a uh, a vote that we waive the reading of all these policies. I'll make a motion that we waive the reading of all these uh, policies. affirmations. Whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion on those? All in favor? Uh, right. Thank you. And now I'll make a motion that we approve the, uh, I'm sorry, we adopt the state affirmations listed in your packet and discussed. I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on these? 
All in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you very much. And what do you think? Close We're ready. We're ready? Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, there's chairs in the, if you want to take a moment, do that. Yep. Good, I'll take a moment and... Okay, I would ask everyone to please be quiet. We're going to start public comment. And uh, before we begin public comments, as I mentioned previously, we're not going to make, be making any final decisions about the dog park this evening. That being said, we're happy to hear your comments as always. We have a very full agenda tonight, so in the interest of time, please limit your remarks to no more than two minutes. And again, if you have submitted a letter or an email, we do have them. There is no need to read your letter if you've already sent it to us. And then i just just like to add that I know people can become passionate while discussing their pets. I'm extremely passionate about my pets. Believe me, I feel it myself. But I want to remind everyone that we are all neighbors and we must remain friends and friendly. Even if we sometimes disagree, let's try to be kind when we speak to each other. So be, I know Karen, our ACO, wants to speak. I'd like to call on her first because I know she has to go somewhere, correct? So you have the, just sign in and uh, please give us your two minutes. Okay. Somebody timing these things? Are we signing? Are we timing? That's not it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hello. Name and, yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Karen Lombardi. I am an animal control officer for the town of Woodbridge. I have been. What? I can't hear you. Is that working? Is the red light on? Yeah. Nothing. Got nothing. So anyway, I'm Karen Lombardi, and I am one of the animal control officers in Woodbridge. And I have had certain members of the public and the board that have both stopped at the shelter to give me their opinions, uh, both pro and con to the Fitzgerald property. I think everybody knows it's a given. We have a dog park. We just don't know where it's going to be. Um, in my opinion, and I have shared this with whomever has asked, I think the Fitzgerald property is to capacity on the amount of uses there. I do like the town campus property. I know a lot of people are not going to think it's big enough, but I truly think that it can be expanded somewhat from what's there right now. I walked it with Adam Parsons this morning, and I really think that that suits a lot of uh, purposes for the dog park. The parking will be level and easy and right there. Um, I do think there is enough land for a dog park. There's also a jog in the property that would probably very adequately suit small dog if you were to separate them. Um, I don't have a problem with the Country Club of Woodbridge either in the tennis court area, but a lot of people seem to feel that it's too isolated there. So out of respect for that opinion, I think the town campus is probably your best bet, in my opinion. It's uh, a reduced liability to the other people that enjoy Fitzgerald, for instance. And uh, I just think it would work very nicely. Okay. Next. Laura Torrance, 17 Vernon Court. Um, we all agree that we think a dog park's a wonderful idea and we've wanted it for a long time, but the, I don't know what the right word is, but the uh, fantasy that it's not going to cost anything is incorrect. It's going to take time from animal control, a tremendous amount of time. And so that's not going to be free. Karen doesn't work for free, neither does any of the staff there. There's an, if there's an accident, if there's a problem, if someone falls down, the fire department, the police, I think that 
as a resident, what I'd like to see and what I'd feel comfortable with, I have not walked any of these properties. I have a fenced in yard, so I'm not interested. And I have dogs that would not play well with others. I don't think people really understand that. They think their dogs are all going to have fun, and they might not. They might. And I think that the people that should be deciding where the park is and how it's laid out should be professionals, not passionate pet owners who love their pets and think the pets are going to have a fun time. I think the police should be involved. I think the firemen should be involved. I think planning and zoning should be involved. It's not just a simple thing of putting up a fence and the dogs will all run around and have a good time. There's parking. There's all kinds of issues. And when there is an emergency, the person that persons that will be called will be animal control to solve the problem. The complaints, the time that's involved, and I think that all has to be taken into consideration by all of you because it's not going to be a zero amount of time for animal control. We're already absolutely to the brim with no time for anything. So if someone's dog runs away and has to be found, if someone leaves their dog and goes for a walk, there's a million scenarios, none of which I'm a professional, but Karen and Ashley both are. And I think that they should be the people that are consulted as to where the location would best suit the town and the time involved, because it's not going to be for free. We're going to need resources from the town, even if the fence gets put up and things. There isn't going to be someone working there. It has to be someone who's a professional who understands animals. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Louisa Cunningham, 89 Pease Road. I don't, uh, Louisa Cunningham, 89 Pease Road. I think the topic of a dog park at Fitzgerald basically boils down to vision versus. I'm sorry, what? Are we going to go by the list or are we just. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I didn't see the list. I'm sorry. I didn't really. We had people sign in. I'm sorry. Constance Cryer Eckland. I live in Woodbridge. Can I just May get I the speak? list when it's done so that oh, I can call people up? But go ahead. My apologies. I shall take okay. only a minute. I hope you no will worries. hear me. I shall speak from the heart. I walk in the Fitzgerald almost every day. Every one of those days, I think how lucky we in Woodbridge are to have paths across fields, under trees, next to exuberant flowers, with very few tranquil branches to help the older legs or bless a memory or inspire vista views, with a small parking lot to keep the heavy metal in an unobtrusive space apart and the gift of a constant long view of solid nature. I love dogs. I do not own one, but unless the owner is listening on an ear set, I ask almost everyone to tell me the breed, the name of the pet. Many say that the pet, large or small, is shy and that they walk in the late evening so as not to meet up with other dogs. The owner and the pet pass on. I pass on. It is quiet. After a day's work, it is especially wonderful. It is bucolic. It is a totally remarkable, open, vast parcel of gifted land without any noise. Dogs in a fenced central space mean more cars in new lots, more benches, owners gathering up their recalcitrant pet, perhaps being bitten, the odor of fecal material on hot days in the rain, Pets getting bitten, or infected, or bullied, or impregnated. Many of the animals barking, all taking away the calm, the tranquility, the non-noise essence of this unbelievable Walden, which is ours to cherish. Please, please, please do not let our precious Walden go to the dogs. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, 
Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Donzello. I live on Hickory Road. Um, it's my understanding that it's already been voted on, that a dog park has already been approved, and we're dealing with location at this point. Uh, I am a lawyer. I will, uh, though, say that I am not a disability attorney, but as a lawyer, I've been asked to research the ADA issue um, on behalf of the group, the dog park group. As you can tell, I'm um, in support of the dog park. Um, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I actually spoke with the U.S. Access Board, which is the ADA board, and I encourage every one of you to speak with them um, so that there are, um, that this misinformation is uh, put to rest. <clears throat> First and foremost, yes, there must be within a parking lot handicapped spaces for individuals, and this is for any outdoor recreational space. As I'm sure uh, will come to no surprise to anyone here, that they do not specifically address dog parks within the ADA. So um, upon speaking with the representative from the Accessibility Board, um, they are equating a dog park, which they admit is a gray area, to an outdoor recreational space. So that being said, um, looking at a parking lot, uh, there must be the handicapped spaces. Two spaces would be sufficient. There has been talk that we must pave all of these surfaces. That is not accurate. In fact, I would like to bring your attention to the language that the representative was very adamant about and clear about. But the language is that it must be a firm, stable, and slip-resistant surface. Now, we can sit here and argue over what makes a firm, stable, slip-resistant surface. People sometimes go the paving route because it's the easiest way, but I can assure you, and speaking about the comments made from the woman previous to me that made them, there's other ways that you can create this type of a surface. And I have to admit, I never heard of these ideas and I had to Google them. But there are things, for example, called soil binders. And when I Googled the soil binders, um, I've noticed that these are used in things such as in the in um, field of baseball fields. Or if you've ever been to Washington, D.C. and walked along the, um, the mall there, when you see these gravel paths, they're actually soil-binded paths that create the path for people with disabilities to utilize. Um, and that um, would create and satisfy the firm, stable, slip-resistant surface. That being said, what I also found, was inter found interesting is that the parking lot, the handicapped spaces are the only spaces that must adhere to this firm, stable, slip-resistant surface. So. If it was a situation where we wanted to pave the parking lot, uh, we would only be required to pave those particular spaces. So I wanted to bring that to the attention of the board as well. Um, <clears throat> moving forward, there must be a path from the parking lot to the dog park. And again, it must satisfy this language that I have been repeating as the representative repeated to me on numerous occasions during our conversation. And again, we can keep this beautiful nature, you know, the scenery, if we decided to go the route of this, um, the soil binder. So I would encourage us to speak with perhaps a maintenance that deals with these issues with the town. I'm not familiar, nor am I an expert in that area. Um, then once you get to the dog park, the uh, gate, which there would be a gate, obviously, because the fenced-in area would have to be big enough for an individual in a wheelchair to be able to access it and go through. Um, once inside the dog park, there are no requirements. So there are no other requirements that must be met. Um, what they had suggested, because yes, we probably would add benches within the dog park, because not everyone is wheelchair-bound. We do have individuals who walk with walkers and canes and things of that nature. Um, they suggested that if we were to have benches or perhaps picnic tables where you have a bench on one side and the other side is vacant for wheelchair individuals, that those, uh, the bench and the picnic table um, are situated next to the gate. And that would minimize any necessity for additional pathways throughout the park. So those were suggestions from, again, the U.S. Accessibility Board in Washington, D.C. And again, I would encourage everyone to read the Park and Recreation Area of the ADA. I think it would shed some light on some of the misnomers out there that we must pave the entire area. In my personal opinion, I believe that Fitzgerald would be the perfect area uh, for the dog park, given um, these suggestions um, as articulated by the ADA. I think they would be easily remedied if we were to remain there. 
and I'm going to defer the reasons why to the other members of um, the committee. I don't want to take too much of your time up. If I just may double check, I didn't miss anything. Um, and I believe that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. May I request that I may be given maybe 10 minutes, if not possible, maybe seven minutes, because I cannot introduce being the subject in two minutes. Yeah, I can be the last person. I can be the last person. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, very good. All right. Uh, Ray Clement. Hello, my name is Ray Clemens and I live at 10 Timber Lane. Um, I have, I also work at uh, Yale University, I'm a librarian, and um, I have a non-obvious uh, disability which, which makes my mobility uh, limited. Um, and so uh, for me, the idea of having a dog park is a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to both socialize uh, with other people in the town of Woodbridge, um, as well as to uh, get enough exercise for a dog that otherwise uh, would be uh, extremely unhappy. Um, even if you decide uh, not to put the dog part at Fitzgerald, I would like to see the uh, Fitzgerald to be ADA compliant. Um, I think that's one of those things that, that we owe our citizens, uh, especially if, as mentioned, it's not a terribly expensive uh, resource to do so. Um, I also understand that as a town, it's difficult when uh, people feel they own things um, as a park, uh, that uh, sharing can often be a, a useful uh, thing. And um, I'm sure people find, might find the dog park to be an apocalypse, Having been to many, many dog parks over the past few years, they're extremely quiet. The dogs aren't mating <laughs> um, or other such things in public. Um, uh, owners do clean up after their own dogs. Uh, they're all always bad actors, bad situations. Um, but uh, if uh, the town is unable to, to handle the increased uh, use, which I, 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 I don't find that logical, um, but uh, perhaps we should work on uh, better funding uh, of those agencies. Thank you. <laughs> Michael Broderick, Five Old Still Road. Uh, I am an animal professional and I am a member of the group. And I wanted to express my opinion uh, about the dog park. Uh, it's one of the most necessary things that we don't have in town. Woodbridge does not have enough places to socialize, and that's one of the real detriments of this town. And um, so it's, it, you know, I'm very, very happy the board approved it. Now, I want to just make a comment about sites. Dog park research, this group has really, really done a very, very good job with. Not only have they visited all the local dog parks, they've also looked into what the size requirements are. And the minimum size requirement to have a two-tiered dog park, which is really what we want, one for the small dogs and one for the large dog, because that will help uh, minimize, uh, you know, problems with... Um, with injuries if any dogs ever don't get along. Uh, you really need about an acre. And um, I believe this site over on the town campus, which actually is where the original dog park uh, was, was thought to maybe be, is a little too small to have both those sections. So I, I want to say, and I also have been thinking a lot about uh, the Woodbridge Country Club. I, I was a former member of planning and zoning and wrote the last plan of conservation and development. And the um, reason I don't think the dog park should be at the Country Club is I really don't think we should chop it up until we really know what we want to do with it. Because as a town, we have not come to a conclusion. So I, I'm against having it there for that reason. 
Um, I think there's a lot of other, you know, possibilities there, uh, you know, other than the dog park that, that would be better. Um, so I'm in favor of Fitzgerald, and I want to uh, also make a couple comments about tranquility of Fitzgerald, because I absolutely agree that it's a lovely tract of land, it's beautiful. We have to all remember as a community that there's already tons and tons of dogs walking around there. So it, we're not going to have really any change of use in Fitzgerald. Uh, a matter of fact, it might actually keep Fitzgerald neater because dogs will be uh, in do the dog park. We have a whole set of rules. Of course, picking up all the dog parks uh, do that. So there won't be any horrible odor. I haven't visited any of the dog parks and found an odor. Um, and, and I absolutely agree. When dogs are at the park, they're usually not barking. They're playing and uh, frolicking with each other. And it's not, it's not a thing that should really disturb a lot of people, I don't think at all. I, I'm not set on exactly where it should be there, uh, whether it should be in the lower field or the chestnut orchard, but that, that's for our town fathers and, and, and mothers to decide. Uh, but uh, I think that it's certainly the best site. There's already parking there. Um, it just makes the most sense. And I don't think it would detract from the things that, that, that some of our other town residents are concerned about because it just is not going to be any different. The whole idea of the dog park is to have a compliant community that teaches canine citizenship. That, and if you go to these dog parks, the people who go there enforce the rule. If somebody is not complying, they kick them out. And, and that's, that's kind of, I'm sure, how our dog park will be as well. <clears throat> so I hope, uh, I hope it can be at Fitzgerald. One last thing I want the town to understand. When I was on planning and zoning, I know the use, when Fitzgerald was purchased by the town, it was, it was purchased for town uses, not open space and i don't and i'm not against the idea as beautiful open space for most of it and the community gardens and the other things that are there but like we built the firehouse there there's no reason in this community that we cannot accommodate the huge number of dog owners and they really are a large group in this town and and that is something you know that could really really be a nice town use so I hope, I hope the board will really think about all those things and, um, you know, and make a good decision. Thanks. So much as I love dogs, and I also think the idea of dog park for Woodbridge is um, an absolute must, I think in the case of Fitzgerald, it boils down to vision versus convenience, and at worst, complacency. We definitely do need a dog park, but an elderly friend of mine, over the weekend while birding for the Connecticut Bird Atlas at Fitzgerald, came across five dogs in the backfield, off-leash, frolicking around. She headed into the woods, came out again. One of the large dogs came bounding down, jumped on her. This is a person who can't afford to fall due to some of us, some of us unfortunately, dealing with bone density issues. Um, an enclosure for dogs somewhere in town certainly is a good idea, but meantime, I think we need some increased signage at, at um, Fitzgerald encouraging people to keep their dogs on leash. In my opinion, tranquility is the attraction of Fitzgerald for many of us who garden there, who walk there, and might even spend time birding there. I don't associate dogs frolicking and barking, coming and going with tranquility. Certainly, we've had an increase in dogs, but there was a time when Fitzgerald was truly a great place to bird, to garden. A dog park will greatly diminish the very thing, I think, that is special about Fitzgerald. Additionally, there are people who are very uncomfortable around dogs. 
I have friends and family who are in fact terrified of dog, some of them having been bitten by a dog. If you walk with such a person, their fear is almost visceral. There are numerous public properties around Woodbridge. I don't see why we can't identify one, much like one was identified in Bethany. Or what about the space behind the tennis court on Center Road, where there's parking? I also think that the family whose children are memorialized at the Choo Choo Park on Center Road, if asked, might be pleased if that very unutilized, underutilized equipment for young children were moved to Pease Road. This would give young siblings a place to play while older ones are playing soccer or on the more advanced playground. So what is our vision for the special Fitzgerald track? Is it a place to unwind, to garden, to listen to bird song, for us to enjoy wildlife as we have in the past, or will it become a multi-purpose space that loses its charm just as other towns have lost unique spaces and buildings for lack of care, planning, and vision. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Crystal Scalzo, 67 Whippewag Road. Um, I happen to be the tender of the uh, plots uh, in the back section of the uh, community gardens. Many of you are probably familiar with them. They're the native shrub garden and the orchard. Uh, I planted them there about 10 years ago and have opened them up to the townspeople um, to enjoy. I specifically have not fenced it in so that people would feel free to come in and sit on the bench that I built there and the uh, Adirondack chairs that I placed there. I've uh, spent a tremendous amount of time there and in doing so, I've really gotten to know Fitzgerald property extremely well, and I've gotten to get a real sense of the people who, who come and visit and, and do enjoy the Fitzgerald property, specifically that back end and that back deal. Um, and I must say that I think a dog park in that area is a terrible idea. I'm a dog lover. I'm very much in favor of a dog park. I think a two-section dog park with an area for small dogs and an area for, for big dogs is a great idea. If you're familiar with Ninigret Park in Rhode Island, that's exactly what they have. It's fabulous. The dogs there have a great time. The dog owners get to interact. So again, I'm not against dogs at all. I love dogs. I have them myself. I think just that back section of, of Fitzgerald is a terrible idea, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's a wild space. There's already too much fencing in, in the gardens area as it is. Each individual plot tends to be fenced in, and it does take away from the, the appeal of the area. Uh, we, we tolerated the, the building of the fence for the uh, chestnut tree farm. That's a big fenced in area as well. How many more fences are we going to put around our open space in Fitzgerald before we start to think it just looks like some sort of back lot somewhere? Uh, it really would detract. Um, other things about it is it's um, a, a sort of a meadow. It's a hay field that's mowed once a year. Um, it's got a lot of uh, um, wild plants growing in there. There's actually a lot of ticks in there as well. And if you want to try to convert that to a dog park, you're going to have a lot of ticks on the dogs and on the people that come to bring the dogs there. Um, there are a lot of people who, who walk the trails back there and really enjoy the, the, the quiet, the solitude. The back end is not as noisy and as heavily traveled as the front portion of, of Fitzgerald near the parking area. It raises the other issue. If, you know, we've been trying to reduce, and I know the push on, of the... Um, uh, community gardens people are trying to reduce the, the driving, you know, the, the road traffic, the car traffic going back towards the back end. Uh, and there's been talk of putting up a gate uh, at the existing parking lot and, and, and having people only walk in from there, including the gardeners, except if they have something to unload. So if you want to put a dog park in the back end, you're going to be creating a situation where either people have to park and walk their dogs a long distance to get to the dog park, which is impractical, or create a parking area with, with handicapped spaces in the back end, and that would take up a lot of space. Um, and then again, create a lot of traffic for driving up and down the road to, through the garden area. So um, again, I think for all those reasons, the back end, uh, you know, the meadow in the back part of the, of the Fitzgerald property is not the place to put a dog park. 
I very much hope that you do find a good place that, that meets all the various criteria, does not invade on the existing open space and the, 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 you know, the pleasant aspects of the existing space. Thank you for your attention. Good evening. Um, Amy Morella at 184 Rimmon Road. Am I speaking enough? Lovely. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm here to make two points uh, with some detailed illustration. You'll walk through. Give me time to do it. The first is that Fitzgerald Track is a town gem and is a unique asset of the town and therefore should be protected from change. Um, I say that because um, Fitzgerald Track really sets our town apart. We're unique in having these walking trails as an amenity. And I think that um, just as our outstanding schools are a draw to our town, um, I think the Fitzgerald Track are a neat, unique aspect when people are looking where to live. Um, they were built, uh, for those who don't know, um, back in the 1990s. And they were built um, through the advocacy of the Town Conservation Commission who were promoting construction of the trails because at the time people were talking about building ball fields over there. Um, and that um, as two past uh, members of the commission stated in a letter to the uh, paper in uh, this past fall, by placing trails at the site, uh, the commission hoped to offer this unique walking experience for residents while preserving the tranquility of the agrarian character of Fitzgerald. The, the only thing was at Fitzgerald um, before the walking trails were the community gardens because they, they pre, predate the walking trails. Um, they've come and go in popularity, but they've actually, actually existed for quite a long time. Um, since the trails were built um, over the idea of ball fields, um, there was a proposal for a new firehouse that would have actually required rerouting um, the trails to a modest degree in order to bring the new firehouse uh, to in a larger plot. Beth, you remember that very well. It was in uh, 2004. And I came to town hall this afternoon. And um, unfortunately, the actual petition at the time is no longer available um, in full. Um, but the record reflects from the Board of Selectmen in February 11, 2004, that um, Jim Urbano handed over to the clerk, Mrs. Shaw, a 600 signatory petition entitled to the Woodbridge Board of Selectmen, I am a Woodbridge taxpayer and I support preserving the 130 acre Fitzgerald property as open space and uh, for passive recreation and oppose any development. Um, he also stated that were additional signatures that um, uh, had been attained and not presented. Um, and subsequently, I was trying to remember, Beth, I think the proposal went forward anyway and was defeated um, in a referendum. Um, yes, uh, to do that. Um, so um, I'm, I'm aware of two other things that have been placed at Fitzgerald uh, since the 1990s. Um, one is the um, Chestnut Grove fencing. Um, I was on this uh, board of selectmen at the time. The sense was that that was agrarian for a specific purpose. Um, it's lasted a lot longer than we thought it would um, because the chestnuts have survived the blight. Um, but it is not actually recreation, uh, if you think about it. I mean, it's, it's there uh, and used uh, very little. Um, and then in addition, there is the skating rink. Um, and I went this afternoon and um, I think you better look. Um, I need to get this confirmed. But when I was first selectman, I was always told that it had never been permitted properly. Um, it had never gone to inland wetlands. And I think that may prove to be true. Um, so uh, I know there are plans to make changes to it. And you better check. <laughs> so um, I say all this because I think there has been a repeated sentiment in the town that uh, folks like the walking trails and like um, Fitzgerald the way it is. And I personally, and I think and others, were very pleased when uh, the town made the effort to reduce the conflict of cars and people uh, by limiting access uh, to um, uh, uh, cars beyond the existing parking lot. I would actually encourage you um, 
to do some enforcement of that um, because um, it's been ignored at times. Um, that being said, is, this is my question for you. If you change course and you put a new recreation structure into Fitzgerald after this long history of ball fields being turned down and uh, firehouses turned, et cetera, what are you going to say to the next proposal? Um, and my concern is very much creep. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a woman who wanted to put a yoga platform there. The Recreation Commission has a long list of wants. Um, and I think that um, it is, uh, to use uh, Louise's term, a better vision um, and better planning uh, to say, no, this is special character, a unique asset uh, for our town. We want to keep it the way it is uh, for the many people who enjoy it the way it is, and we can find another place for this dog park. The other thing I just wanted to clarify and, uh, about um, is um, this issue of um, ADA parking. Um, and um, I just want to make sure that the, all the board of selectmen are aware that in the proposal um, from October 12, 2017, uh, that was uh, presented and prepared by uh, uh, dog park advocates here. I don't know what you call your group, Bonnie, but the dog, dog park, park advocates. advocates is that works? People in favor of the right, dog right, park. right. That's but that proposes on October 12, 2017. That has two quotes um, that highlight the need to accommodate dog owners with impaired mobility. The first one says on page two, many of us have. Many have come to us asking for assistance to get this park created as soon as possible, as their doctors have recommended they give up their beloved pets before they have a bad fall walking them. The second quote also on page two, more than half those walking their dogs at the fields are over 50. I am one of them. Um, several have a leash in one hand and a cane in the other. Others have obvious mobility issues. So I raised this ADA issue uh, to Coopop in January because when I looked at the ADA guide for small towns, and at, just like the previous speaker, I am a lawyer, I am not an ADA expert, um, but when you look at specifically a guide for small towns that is available on the web through the U.S. Department of Justice, put out by the Department of Justice, it, it talks about what you should do as well as what you must do. Uh, when it comes to parks and recreation. And if I understood correctly, the uh, advice, by, advice by the phone was two, two parking spaces. Um, uh, at Coopop, I didn't go so far as to say how many there would be a need to be. The point is that you better think about ADA parking. And in this town where we're blessed to have, thanks in large part to Terry and to Joe, uh, to a beautiful playground for all kids, um, we ought to be thinking the same way when we're putting in new structures, that we don't do just what the law requires, but what is best for our community. And given the uh, statements in the proposal by the dog park advocates, um, I would suggest that there needs to be at least two um, ADA parking spaces right available at the dog park. And that, to me, would conflict with the very effort that you've made to reduce to cars by putting up the signage that you have. You're ending up with cars driving on the exact same pathway where people are walking. Um, it just seems to me that it's a good idea to look somewhere else. Um, so um, that's it for now, except I would like to give you a heads up um, that there's more than one petition. Um, as of Monday, some of us have started another petition, um, and uh, we'd appreciate the opportunity um, to have an opportunity and go out and uh, talk to some people, since if you notice, the weather's a bit cold. Um, there aren't uh, that many people out and about, um, and uh, we uh, will need a little time to have a chance to talk. To Thank you very much. Could I say something? I'm not on the list. For 10 minutes. I know. Easy. We're, we're trying to fair. limit this to two minutes. So uh, you know, yeah, I, I understand that. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yep. Come on up. It's okay. Wait, I, I, I will just... only take a moment. Okay. It would be nice in this room. First of all, you have 356 petitions. Mm -hmm. They were petitions for the Fitzgerald property. 
in favor of the Fitzgerald property. So my first question would be, what are we arguing about? The second proposal would be, why don't the people in the room right now raise their hands who are for the dog park? Who are these people that are for the dog park? Put your hands up, please. The people at the Fitzgerald property, raise your hands, please. The people who are against the Fitzgerald property. Okay. The numbers, what are the numbers? <laughs> the arguments against the Fitzgerald property, in my opinion, are specious. Specious, period. They're self serving because you have your driveway to your property and you drive on your property down the road to go gardening. That's fine, no objection. But you're objecting if I drive my car to the dog park. What's the difference? Is there a difference? Is your argument specious? It's not? It's not self-serving? It's not just, clouded? Uh, yeah, because this is more, it's not an interactive. I'm sorry, I'm done. It's okay. I need your, I'm done. I know, I need your name and address for the record for Mrs. Shaw. I'm Robert Brighton Stein. I live on 142 Seymour Road. Okay. I'm the guy with the cane. I see that. <laughs> I'm 82 years old. Okay. I'm the threatened invalid. Okay. Another argument which is ridiculous. So, okay, why don't we get this done? Now, Bonnie. Uh, Breitenstein and Bonnie Blake, 64 Beecher Road. The Fitzgerald property has evolved. It's not what it was in the 70s. Like everything else, things change. Um, it is no longer the primary location people go for tranquility because it's bounded by two main roads. And if I want tranquility, I am not going to Fitzgerald property because someone's going to talk to me. And if I want peace and quiet, I go in the woods. And we're blessed with hundreds of acres of woods and meadows and private quiet areas. And Lord knows the country club is so deserted these days. You could walk there for hours and never run into a human. And Beautiful birding there and nature, and it's wonderful. People are going to the Fitzgerald property to see and speak with their neighbors. That's what it's become. It's not what it was in 1977. Um, the, uh, it's, it's a community gathering place, and the, but moving to the next spot, the trails are not going to be affected by a dog park. People can still walk down their trails. Uh, the meadow, if you get a dog park, people won't be letting their dogs off leash. They shouldn't be doing that. They should be in a dog park where it's fenced in. Uh, the ordinance committee is looking into possibly designated off leash areas, and then people will stop misbehaving. Um, the d dog park is open space. I beg you, before you make a judgment, whether it's about another human being or an issue, that you educate yourself about the issue instead of making a judgment. Go to Shelton, as Joe mentioned. Go to um, Naugatuck, they just finished theirs this past year. Go to any one of the hundreds around the state and see that they are beautiful. Hills and vales and you know um, trees and grass. If we put a dog park in that orchard a year later, it will look no different than it does today. It will be the same. It will be a natural environment. As far as benches and people sitting, there's already benches and people sitting all over the Fitzgerald field. It's not going to change. We might add some within the, 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 feet, the uh, uh, fence and area. Um, the orchard is the primary place the town is considering, not the lower meadow anymore. Um, there, the fence is already there. We've already gotten used to that fence. Um, Cars and parking, unless I understand some people are afraid of dogs and some people don't want to be approached by dogs. I agree. No one has a right to allow their dog to approach another human being or another dog, period. End of subject. 
you have to ask permission first. We got a nice document from the Connecticut Council of Municipalities showing statistics on the number of dog bites, bites declining dramatically since dog parks were instituted in the state. It's a dramatic change, and they attribute it to the incidents, the increased use of dog parks, because it creates better behaved dogs and less aggressive dogs and less bites and people less less often being annoyed by dogs. So if you, unless the town is prepared to ban dogs from Fitzgerald, they're there. Guess what? You got to deal with them. That's where they go. That's the primary location for walking one's dog. Wouldn't it be lovely to let them go into a fenced in area so they're less annoying if you think they're annoying? Now they're not racing down trails. Now they're not you know, knocking people over. They're in there. They get some, you know, 10 minutes of running around a dog park. Dogs are so much better behaved, and then the owners can get their own exercise by walking down the trail where the dog is now going to behave. The reason why we prefer Fitzgerald, 10 to 1, I'm not good at odds, you know what I'm saying, is that it's the primary place for dogs, so you don't want to put a square peg in a round hole. You want to put dogs where they're not welcomed. Number two, you need an acre and a half. I use the example of trying to put two people in an elevator or 25. You get 25 people in an elevator and someone's itching and el elbowing and whatnot, you got tension. You don't want a bunch of dogs in a too small area. The separate two areas, one area is not just for small dogs, it's for elderly dogs, timid dogs. It's for someone who just adopted a dog and doesn't know how well they'll play, you take them into the small dog area. So by the time you do the small dog area, the main dog area, and the double gate entry, that area over behind uh, next to the tennis courts, the most you could get was about a half acre. It might only be a quarter of acre. It's just not going to work. The other reason why it's not going to work is that I'm advocating for the 55 and older crowd which makes up more than half of our town. We would like a place to call our own. We don't want to drive to a dog park and get out of our cars and there's no one there. We want to be able to see people and greet people. If it's at the orchard, the Fitzgerald, and there's no one in the park, we can still get our exercise by walking along the paths. We can go up to someone and say, hey, Ramey, you want to meet me in the dog park and whatnot. This is not going to be a Las Vegas nightclub. There is no reason for people to be driving all from the state to come to Woodbridge's lousy little dog park. We will have one of the smallest dog parks in the state. Every town around us has a dog park. Wood, uh, New Haven has five. Why would people drive here? They just don't. When you've got a dog and you're trying to go to work in the morning or after work, you're going to go to the one that's closest to you. You're not going to drive miles away. The only time people drive to other dog parks is when it's these 14-acre hills and vales and lakes and meadows and whatnot. We're not going to have that. So I, I just think you've got to go visit one, see what they're like. You've got to know the facts. We've spent months talking to people from all over the state. We've talked to dog experts, dog trainers, we animal, our animal control people. And I have never been in a dog park where the police were called. I'm sure it happens, but it's not the norm. There's never been an animal control. I have never seen a bad fight. I've seen dogs start getting roughhousing and the owners, boom, stop it. Because you don't want your own dog injured. So this image of, and smell, we would have to go a whole year without cleaning poop in a dog park to mimic the smell of that horrible manure pile right next to the path. You talk about being disgusted. Every time I walk by that in the summer, I want to throw up. It's so god-awful smelly, and the dogs all want to go sniff it. So why is that okay to have a pile of manure that goes over my head, but they're worried a couple of dog poops? Come on. And when you're in a dog park, your dog squats and poops, someone is going to get on you in two seconds flat. Hey, go clean up after your dog. Thank you. Oh, oh, and also, one of the letters said dogs will be dropped off and people go for a walk 
No, they won't. Maybe those people are the ones that drop their kids off on a playground and take off. These rules in front of the dog park will be the strictest rules you have ever seen. Clean up. You have to have your dog's license. They have to be vaccinated. They have to be under your control at all times. Your dog has to be within your sight at all times. You have to be able to reach out and grab your dog. You cannot be out of the park. If your dog is acting up, you will be asked to leave and maybe get another chance, unless it was vicious. If it was vicious, you're never coming back. Um, if it's, it acts up, you might get another chance, but that's it. That's it. This behavior that's mentioned is never going to be tolerated. Who's going to police that? Visit dog parks around the state. The people who are there, police it. Yes, I'm sorry. Rami Ackley, 20 Seymour Road, and I've spoken many times. I'm, I just want to address a couple of things. First of all, I am a community gardener and I am a dog park advocate. I have driven my car back there and parked. Yes, I have. But I also notice a lot of the people that are here that are also gardeners put their cars there and leave them there. They don't drop off their stuff and then go park their car because that's really inconvenient. They want to be able to go to their car and keep getting their tools. So if you're going to talk about cars going down that to those gardens in that back area, then you really need to tell the gardeners that they need to stop driving back there and staying there. The birders do the same thing. The gentlemen that put their Adirondack chairs, no offense, but I see your car parked there the whole time you are staying there. You are not taking your car back to the lot at the front. So I have a bone of contention with that. The other thing is the track and field events go on there and they are far from quiet. Hockey is far from quiet, ice hockey. So yes, there is a lot of beautiful peace and tranquility, but there are also times when there are little children running and playing and laughing like little children do, and that does not offend me. It is a space that is not really just an open space. It's designated a public space. So I own that property and everybody in this room owns that property because we're the ones that are paying the taxes. It's about time that some other people, the majority of the people in the town that have the dogs that are walking over there already are recognized. The gardeners are a small percentage and I'm one of them compared to the dog walkers over there. And dare I say the birders as well. I'm a birder. I take my binoculars. I bird over there, but I also take my dog with me. And guess what? They're compatible. It's, some of these arguments are just arguments because some of the people that have addressed these issues never want change of any kind, in any way, shape, and form. And it's not 2004. It's not 2006. It's 2018. And I'm a newcomer to this community, and there are many other new families moving in. And one of the main attractions for a young family with children is coming into a community that has the amenity of a dog park. You just Google it and you'll see what I'm talking about. That's why every other town around us has a dog park. But they don't want to take their children and go to a place behind a dump or off to an area where they're never going to see the other families with children. The social aspect of this dog park is key. That's why I go to Fitzgerald. I would have never met people otherwise. You don't have children in this town. It's hard to meet people. Those of you who have lived here all your lives don't relate to that because you've grown up with each other. You've had children in the school system. It's very hard for new people to this town to network and to feel included. In fact, I feel excluded many times just because I don't have children in the school system. But I have a dog, and guess what? He likes Fitzgerald Fields, and so do I. And many people are like me in this town. Many of the friends that have signed the 352 signatures on the petition are not residents that have lived here all of their lives. Many of them have moved to this community because it is bucolic and peaceful and beautiful, and they have dogs. And that doesn't detract from the beauty and the serenity. So I implore you to recognize that the majority of the people are in favor of that area, mainly because it's where we already go. 
So there's not going to be a whole lot of additional traffic. And if you want to talk about traffic, then you need to tell the gardeners and the birders to keep their cars down by the parking lot where they're supposed to, because that's what the sign says. Thank you very much. Yes, but not about the dog track. Dog park. So. <laughs> it's not about dog park, but it's related to physical property and a beautiful portion of that. And okay. just once, is everyone done that would like to address the dog park? So the comments are ended. Okay, on that part. Okay. And I seek permission to take more time rather than. I am Durga Prasad. I live at Unremond Street, 12 Raymond Street. I want to say something about Shanti Rose Garden. Dear honorable members of the Board of Selectmen, citizens of the town of Woodbridge, and staff and officers of town government, thank you very much for providing me this opportunity to speak to you about the current status and future of the Shanti Rose Garden. Santi Rose Garden is a gift of nature to our town of Woodbridge and makes the community garden center more beautiful, pleasant, and enjoyable. In India, there is a saying, Hey Gulab, Phoolon Ka Raja, Lily Phool Ki Rani. Translated into English, it says, Rose is the king of flowers and Lily the queen. Sweet, vibrating fragrance emanating from almost 65 varieties of adorable roses of different kinds, colors, and sizes in the garden, make the atmosphere around the garden full of peace, joy, and happiness. The presence of hummingbirds, butterflies, honeybees, birds of different kinds and colors in the garden, along with the aroma of herbs and melodious sweet song of birds in the environment around the garden, takes a person to a unique journey to a trance. Town citizens and other visitors rejoice the environment so much that they never get tired to praise and make commendable appreciating comments again and again. It is a very valuable asset to the town. I think no one would like this garden to be extinguished after my death. As I understand, one of the most important responsibilities of the town in modern time is to keep the town clean, pollution-free, beautiful, and pleasant. Rose Garden is a humble effort in that direction. Without taking much of your valuable time to describe in detail, I would like to mention briefly about the origin and current status of the garden. In June 2014, I was sitting with my wife, Santi, in the vegetable garden, which was there at that time, and all of a sudden felt compelled by some individual power to propose to Santi to convert our vegetable garden into a small rose garden. Santi spontaneously agreed, but who knew what was going to happen? 
Santi passed away in August 2014. Next month in September, I mentioned about, mentioned about our conversation to family members and with their, un, with their enthusiastic support, started planning and establishing the proposed garden. It was completed in August 2015 and it happened again that some individual forces abruptly created circumstances as if they, as if they were telling me to declare this garden a Santi Rose Garden open to public. On August 18, 2015, in a ribbon cutting ceremony, Honorable Alan Scalator, the then first selectman, and Honorable Joe Crisco, who is here, the then senator, declared the garden open to the public. Soon after, I informally donated the garden, including the benches, tables, structures, and plants to the town and started maintaining it as a volunteer. A private vegetable garden thus became a wonderful public rose garden. Beauty of the nature cannot be bought and sold at will. It comes by the grace of God. Therefore, when it comes, it must be accepted with grace, enjoyed by heart, and most importantly, preserved by all means available. Today I wish to propose and present to the Board of Selectmen and share with you all a plan to convert the town's informal de facto ownership of the garden into formal de jure ownership and for the preservation of the Santi Rose Garden during my life and after my death. Now here is the proposed plan. One, I request the Board of Selectmen to formally approve and accept the following donation. I, Durga Prasad, resident of 12 Raymond Street, Woodbridge, Connecticut 06525, hereby donate the Santi Rose Garden, including all the benches, tables, structures, and plants located in the community garden center of the town to the town of Woodbridge. Two, I request the Board of Selectmen to grant permission to me to maintain and approve the Santi Rose Garden as a volunteer during my life. I request the Board of Selectmen, number three, I request the Board of Selectmen to create a Santi Rose Garden Fund for the maintenance and improvement of the Santi Rose Garden with the minimum seed money needed for the creation to be provided by me and a life insurance benefit with a face value of 50,000 to be transferred by me to the fund. The money in this fund must be earmarked for the purposes mentioned above. Four, I request the Board of Selectmen to instruct the office of the town to arrange for the transfer of allotment of the two lots upon which the garden is situated from me to the town. I promise as a volunteer to pay the rent or fee, whatever, to the community garden center during my life. Five, and the last one. I request the Board of Selectmen to, to resolve that the town will take over the maintenance, improvement, and management of the Santi Rose Garden after my death. In my concluding remark, I would like to emphasize that even though the amount of almost $100,000, $50,000 is already invested, and $50,000 benefits to be transferred, may appear to be small to the Board of Selectmen the opportunity presented here is unique and rare. It has come as a gift of nature, and unless utilized timely, the opportunity will be gone, and the garden will slowly extinguish and become part of the nature after my death. I will remain grateful all my life to our town for all these benefits to my family and me. Thanking you again, sincerely, Durga. So that's my presentation to you, and that's my request to Allah. Please consider it sympathetically. Mm -hmm.